Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Lynette Beery from Zero to Thrive at Michigan Medicine. We're really happy that you're joining us this evening for returning to child care during the pandemic strategies for fi fighting COVID-19. It's a beautiful evening where I am, depending upon where you are in Michigan. Uh, I, maybe it isn't, but I hope everyone has the sunshine that I have out my window, even though it's a little breezy and chilly. Uh, it does seem that spring is on the way for Michigan. Um, let me tell you just briefly about Zero to Thrive. Our mission is to spark scientific discoveries, quality training, and vibrant cross-sector initiatives that create breakthrough real-world solutions to transform the well-being and resilience of families from conception to early childhood with impacts for generations to come. We're happy to be here this evening uh, with the governor's office and a couple of our colleagues from, the, from pediatrics who are also part of the Zero to Thrive Translational Network. This evening uh, on our panel, we have Michelle Richards, uh, who is the policy advisor for early childhood in Governor Gretchen Whitmer's office. Uh, we have Dr. Andrew Hashikawa, Associate Professor, Michigan Medicine Department of Pediatrics, Emergency Medicine and Dr. Sharon Swindell, academic general pediatrician and child health advocate and former president of the Michigan Academy of American Academy of Pediatricians. Um, before we get started, I'm gonna just uh, invite uh, Michelle to uh, welcome you as well. Michelle. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to spend a little bit of time with us. Uh, we know that you are making really difficult decisions every day when you're keeping your staff safe, you're trying to keep children in your care safe. And so tonight is all about answering questions from you. I was grateful to many of you who gave us your feedback in the registration. We're gonna talk a lot about vaccination. We're going to talk a lot about the strategies that frankly you've been implementing for a year now in your, um, in your homes and in your childcare centers. Our goal tonight is to put a little wind at your back and help you continue to keep our children um, as safe as possible. So thanks for being here. Put your questions um, for us. We'll be covering a lot of ground tonight, but uh, hold us accountable for covering the content that you wanna hear about and put some questions in the chat and the Q&A. And a couple of other housekeeping items before we dive right in here. Our time, unfortunately, will go by very quickly as it always does on these uh, webinars, there's always way more we want to cover than we end up having time to cover. Uh, we are recording the session, so if you know you miss something, it will be up on the website at zero to thrive.org um, for a few weeks. Uh, given the nature of this topic, we will not leave it up indefinitely, um, and we'll send you an email letting you know when it is up. It takes us usually a few days to get it up there, and then we'll send you an email when, uh, with a few days warning that's going to come down. So you can share it with that with colleagues uh, and let them know uh, that uh, they might want to watch it as well. Um, and um, do put questions in. We will get to as many as we can. We do appreciate that many of you did share questions already with us when you registered. All right, well, let's jump right in with a question for Dr. Andy and Dr. Sharon. So what have we learned in the last year? It's been a long year for all of us. And what are the best strategies at this point for fighting COVID-19? Well, I think Andy will, will be able to take us through, through that in more detail, but the main thing we've learned is that the strategies we've been using or promoting work um, when we use them. So the hand washing, the distancing, the masking, uh, and um, Andy will take us through that. Um, and, you know, we'll talk a lot about the game changer that has come along, which is vaccination um, and, and how that will change what things look like moving forward. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon. So um, uh, I completely agree. Um, the strategies that childcare centers and programs have used have been really effective. If you uh, just, besides COVID-19, if you look at the influenza, the RSV numbers, they are at record lows. And part of that is because of all the strategies we are using. It also kind of suggests how infectious COVID-19 is that 
we're almost seeing zero cases of flu, zero cases of RSV, and yet we are still seeing some COVID-19 cases even in uh, among the young children. So it shows how infectious this is. In terms of the COVID-19 numbers um, in children nationally, there's been about 3.1, 3.2 million children in the United States that have tested positive for COVID-19. So children can get this. But if you look at in terms of adults versus children, this is still about less than you know 15% of all cases that we have in the United States. So um, which just goes to show that you know the although it does uh, occur in children, um, and, you know it affects uh, a lot of adults as well. And I think that's why this will be important when we talk about vaccinations and childcare providers. So um, the hospitalizations and deaths for children have been remarkably low. They do get COVID, but the number of children that are really hospitalized uh, throughout the country have been remarkably low between you know 0.2 to 2.2 percent and the overall death rate from actual covid in children fortunately uh, for this pandemic has been um, ultimately very very low so we're looking at between zero as low as 0.04 percent so fortunately thankfully very low uh during this pandemic and you know um when we talked about guidelines at the beginning as we marked the over the one year anniversary of this you know, we really, childcare providers had to be creative and they had to think differently because of the unique developmental and physiologic differences that are in young children compared to, you know, high school, elementary. So we really needed to work together with pediatricians to come up with a plan. And so what I wanna do is very quickly run through some of the top 10 ways that I've seen childcare providers effectively uh, use to kind of help or mitigate COVID in their childcare pro programs. In Washtenaw County, I run a surveillance program to see infections. And among those childcare centers, rates have been incredibly low for COVID just because of all the other strategies that have been put in place. And so many of you guys are already using this, but some of the things I'll talk about uh, relate to some of the questions that you guys have asked. So I do wanna address those. So cohorting we know, meaning kind of grouping or uh, keeping class sizes small, and together really works. And so this makes contact tracing easier. Um, there's also less to worry about if there are not kids floating from classroom to classroom. And this, if you live in a, work in a center that has extra personnel, keeping kind of the childcare providers, workers together in these same cohorts really seem to make a difference uh, when there is an exposure and when contact tracing or quarantining needs to occur. So that has been very effective in the way we've been able to tr control COVID uh, throughout this time. Masking does work. And it's obvious not only in the rates that we see for influenza and RSV, it's same thing with COVID. Um, the main thing was to really protect yourselves and then childcare providers by wearing masks not only protected themselves, they were acting as a role model. So we know that wearing a mask is safe. And for many of the kids that are above you know, two, they seem to wear it just fine over the year, they, they, they've done really well. So the initial concerns that many of us had, they've, they've been uh, resilient and they've done just fine. So I'm really happy to report that. Um, again, make it fun, be a role model, um, and we do the best we can with this. And it's been very, very successful in many, many, many childcare centers. Um, screening children and staff continue to be important. And again, making sure that you know families are aware of what symptoms to be uh, looking out for. And this applies to your coworkers. If they don't feel good, they really shouldn't come in. Um, and many of the reports that we hear nationally uh, from the CDC and childcare centers, the infection actually came from the, actually the workers and their own families. So being aware of coworkers that are not feeling good, uh, making sure you screen them as well and support each other is going to be really important. And again, there are things online that you can send to parents, hey, what are the symptoms that we look for? Some of them are more difficult to assess in kids, but um, again, uh, making sure that you're on the same page with parents in terms of what to look for is really important to kind of protect the center. Um, again, all programs by now should have a plan and protocols in place and continue to work closely with the health department uh, to learn the latest in terms of screening and, and, and testing. Um, we know these things work because um, uh, there was a, a nice article in Texas in last summer 
when there was a period where they went away from any kind of mitigation strategy. So there was no masking, parents could come in and out. There is no physical distancing. Um, and so they had larger amounts of outbreaks uh, at that time in those childcare centers. So as soon as they kind of went back to what they were doing, the cases went down. So you can kind of see that um, this can occur in a childcare center without the strategies. But again, uh, we've been really successful in our state. So I, I'm very thankful about that. Hand hygiene continues to remain important. Um, it's easily forgotten among all the masking and the emphasis on physical distancing. But again, it's a skill that's important, must be taught to children. And as long as hand sanitizers are not easily accessible to kids, I think that's a very effective way to continue hand hygiene as well. Um, there's some questions about focus cleaning. Uh, fortunately, COVID-19 as a virus um, is not as robust or it's a little bit more wimpy compared to some of the other viruses like norovirus that uh, causes the bad vomiting and diarrhea. So I would say that, you know, bleach really works. I don't think we have to decontaminate or do everything every day. That's too much of a burden, but really targeted cleaning using fresh bleach to the high use areas, rotating toys. Um, really uh, our effective strategy uh, to make sure that things are, are clean. Dishwasher, safe toys, um, things like that really help as well. Um, you know, we talked earlier about you not using as many difficult to clean toys, things that can be individualized like crayons or Play-Doh. We continue to do that because at this age, you know, we know that kids tend to mouth a lot of things. So that's continued to, to be important. But one of the strategies, again, that seems to work well is rotation of toys. Um, if they're away for three or four days, um, they can be brought back into circulation and the viruses, you don't have to worry about that because it's been out of circulation that long. As the weather uh, warms up, um, I know all winter kids have been going outside, but even more so, um, outside seems to be safe. It's the best. We can do classroom activities outside. It's good for their health. And again, it, the virus seems to be a lot more wimpy outdoors. Um, it's a nice time to be able to kind of, uh, even as a staff, as long as you're physically distanced, take a break from your mask as long as you aren't close together, right? And so that going outside is still um, an optimal place to, to be doing this. Nap time uh, continues to be important. Some of the strategy I've seen is head to toe. Uh, we don't recommend masks while napping. Uh, masks can be stored in paper bags. And again, using kind of a continuing to use a single comfort toy that stays at the childcare seems to be working well for many centers when I talk to the directors. Um, other things to consider, uh, many centers have switched over to kind of these masks and chambers with um, albuterol or, or um, as we call puffers instead of nebulizers. They seem to not spread the medicine everywhere and they work very well in kids. So many pediatricians, ERs have been switching and encouraging parents to in childcare centers to switch to um, these spacers and the MDI or multi-dose inhalers. So another way you can kind of uh, reduce the amount of spread that comes from a, a nebulizer. Uh, so that's a strategy I do recommend. Uh, meal time continues uh, with the recommendations, no, no food sharing. It's okay to sit with them physically distanced, group, group, eating as a group is important. Um, we still don't recommend active uh, teeth brushing in a childcare, but again, mealtime is an important part to kind of share and, and be together. So um, still recommend that, but not again, no food sharing. And finally, uh, getting vaccinated, we're gonna talk a lot more about that. You guys are such an important part of these kids' health. You guys are an important part of uh, parents' ability to work. And so protecting you guys is of the utmost importance. I think the where you guys were put in the vaccination schedule uh, highlights how important you guys are in this whole infrastructure. There are many states that where childcare workers were not prioritized, four or five states where they were not included at all. So I'm really happy that we were in a state that prioritized uh, getting the vaccine. So I continue to kind of uh, recommend that we do that. So I'm going to stop there, um, Lynette. Thank you. That was great. Appreciate those slides. Uh, Michelle, do you have a few key policy strategies that uh, at this point a year in you would like to share with us? 
Yeah, I just, I think Dr. Andy covered it. I felt like a bobblehead during his presentation because I think we're seeing so much consistency between what pediatricians are recommending, what the state is recommending, what we're seeing from CDC. Um, and I think we just have better evidence and more information. And so I feel like you're doing the right things. You know what to do at this point. I'm sure that top 10 was no surprise to anyone on the phone um, and trying to reinforce that it's continuing those practices, even as we start to see some light at the end of the tunnel and we start to see more, more individuals getting vaccinated. I think that's gonna be the most important thing for the next uh, several months ahead. Thank you. We did have a lot of questions um, uh, from registrants about childcare workers um, being vaccinated. Um, what are some of the reasons that, uh, that Dr. Andy and Dr. Sharon, that you would recommend that all child care workers um, get right out as soon as possible and, uh, and get their vaccination? Yeah, I, and I, I think we'll, we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about um, some concerns that people might have about them and hopefully we'll be able to make people feel better about the safety of the vaccines. What I would say right up front is the main reason I would want childcare workers to get vaccinated is the same reason I want anyone who's eligible to get vaccinated. It protects you from this infection and it gets us closer to the end of the pandemic. Um, that's the main thing. You know, a half a million people in this country have died from COVID. Um, it, it's, it's just been devastating. So the protection of people is the first thing for me, people's safety. Um, you know, the, the next thing, as Andy said, is um, just childcare workers are so important um, as essential workers and for our children that um, the ability to keep childcare centers free of COVID um, is, is one of the great benefits of having a vaccinated workforce there. I don't know, Dr. Andy, if you have more you wanna add. Yeah, and, and so this is not meant to be, um, I don't wanna scare anyone, but just looking at it in terms of why I think it's so important in, in, in child care providers is it's just simply the risk. So uh, this is a chart from the CDC comparing, um, you know, as you get older, what the risks are for hospitalization even and death as, as you age and comparing it to, you know, the five to 17 years of age of the children. So very, you know, younger kids are a little bit more at risk maybe for hospitalization uh, compared to uh, some of the older kids. But as you look and move towards the right, you can imagine seeing the 30 to 39, 40, 49, your risk of hospitalization goes up significantly um, with uh, COVID-19, 15 times to 35 times, and, and for death as well compared to that group. So I think, um, yes, childcare providers, um, it's really, really important to think about protecting yourself from severe disease. Um, and so that for me is the utmost important importance uh, to protect your health. And so that's why I think childcare providers really need to get vaccinated um, and your guys' health is of the utmost importance. And while we're on the subject of vaccinations, I, I don't wanna lose the opportunity to remind everyone to get all vaccinations, right? Dr. Sharon, do you wanna to speak to that for just a moment with and getting the kids back up to date as well? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Lynette. Um, when the pandemic started a year ago, we didn't know what to do yet, how to keep people safe, how to keep um, doctor's offices safe. And there was a period of time where really everything shut down except uh, for extreme emergencies. So there was a period of time when uh, children weren't coming to the pediatrician for their regular checkups and immunizations. And understandably, a lot of families have still been reluctant to go back for uh, checkups and more and more are willing to do so. You know, for a long time now, 
pediatricians offices have made accommodations to have safe protocols um, so that anyone that needs their checkup and immunizations should be coming in. But we still haven't gotten back to where we were before. And so overall, kids uh, shots are not up to date like we'd like them to be. And so, you know, as a byproduct of the pandemic, we don't want to start seeing outbreaks of measles and whooping cough and all these other um, devastating diseases to children um, as a result of, of this pandemic. So I would just urge um, you to make sure that the families coming into your center are up to date um, on the children's shots as well. Great, yes. So, you know, we've all heard uh, that there are folks out there that are concerned about the safety of the vaccines. And uh, Dr. Sharon alluded to the fact that we would get to this. We did see lots of questions um, from a handful of registrants um, asking about safety. So Dr. Andy, do you wanna tackle the safety questions uh, with regards to vaccines first? And I think Dr. Sharon, you'll probably wanna jump in as well. So I, I think those are all legitimate concerns, right? Um, anytime a, a new vaccine comes uh, comes around. So, you know, I myself, you know, took a look at the information and um, I did get myself uh, the vaccine um, as well. So in early January, and I, I would not have done so if I did not feel it was safe to do. Um, I think uh, there's a couple things that, um, so the vaccine was developed in record time for a couple different reasons. One is because uh, there has been uh, new technology that has been instrumental in doing this. Normally, if we had used kind of older techniques, this would have taken a lot longer. So fortunately, there were a lot of smart people that were able to um, use existing kind of newer technology to come up with this. So it was fast, but it was fast because there, were, there was new technology, really smart people were able to put things together. And it's been, it's been absolutely amazing. I think the second reason is because uh, there was more funding put towards this vaccine than any other drug or vaccine in, in history. And so um, when people think about how fast it was done, it's because they had the money and the resources to do so. And the final point I would, I would say is this vaccine has been um, tested more rigorously than most medications that come on the market that go through multiple cycles. And this was done in thousands and thousands of people. And I, I think Sharon um, kind of commented of how many millions of people have already received this. Um, are there potential side effects in terms of like any other medication? Can you have a, an allergic reaction to it? Yes, but is uh, exceedingly very, very rare. Um, and so it is a very, very safe vaccine. It is very effective, uh, more so than I think people even dreamed of. Um, so it's something that I, I recommend. Um, I've taken it, my wife has, has gotten it. Um, and uh, it's something I would recommend for childcare providers everywhere. Yes, I'll add to that. Um, everything that uh, Andy said, um, you know, it has an emergency use authorization, which basically means that after this rigorous testing, um, a very expert panel looks at all the information available about how it works, what its mechanism is, and what the safety has been in a series of trials, and then are able to say that the benefit of this vaccine outweighs the risk. And when we're talking about that risk, we have to keep remembering how severe this virus has been in our communities and in our country. So the risk of not vaccinating um, is significant. Um, you know, some of the, the questions that I've heard people ask about the vaccine um, is, you know, it's too new. Um, but we do have, I think as of March 1st, 76 million doses of the vaccine had been given in this country. 
there's a pretty systematic way of following the individuals that have had the vaccine and no new safety uh, concerns have arisen. It's, it's actually showing to be even safer than some of the trials in terms of some of the less serious side effects. Um, so that's really reassuring. It also is showing that it's working, that it's protecting the people that are getting it. Some of the things we don't know yet is you might be personally protected, but if you are exposed, can you still give it to someone else? And I think we'll get into that more, but that's one of the reasons we still recommend that even though you've been vaccinated, you still wear a mask like you have been all along. Um, we'll learn more about um, whether you can transmit the virus once you've been vaccinated. So if you're exposed to the virus, your body is protected, but could you still um, shed some virus and give it to someone else? That's the question we're trying to understand. And I think we'll know that before too much longer. Um, some of the other things I've heard people bring up concerns about whether it could affect fertility. There is no evidence that it protect, that it harms fertility. Um, what are some of the other things that I've heard? Oh, could a messenger RNA vaccine affect someone's DNA? No, um, it can't. This is, a, this is a vaccine that cannot enter the cell's nucleus where our DNA is held. So it has no opportunity to change a person's DNA. And I think finally, um, could this vaccine give you COVID? Um, and the answer is no. It doesn't contain the COVID virus. Um, and, and so getting COVID from any of the vaccines that are available right now um, is not possible. So I think those are some of the things I've heard. Um, and just wanted to, to address those. And what about pregnant women? That was a common question we had. The vaccine has not been tested in pregnant women. It's felt that it will be safe for pregnant women, but the advice is if you are pregnant and are considering getting the vaccine that you talk to your doctor about it. Because as you can imagine, your risk from COVID might be different from someone else's. If you have some chronic health conditions um, that would put you at greater risk for COVID complications, um, you might make the decision to get the vaccine while you're pregnant, whereas someone else might not. So that's gonna be a personal choice um, discussed with your doctor. Thank you. We had a lot of questions um, before starting tonight about what will the impact be if some staff members choose to vaccinate and some do not. Um, will there be specific issues that that's going to raise in terms of uh, susceptibility or uh, how will child care uh, directors manage that one? Yeah, I, I can take this one. Um, I think there are a couple different issues. One is, uh, you know, it's, it's important to get as many uh, child care providers, I think, vaccinated because of herd immunity, meaning um, by vaccinating as many people as possible, you protect uh, many of those that maybe can't get it if they have an allergic reaction or some of the younger kids, infants or something that, uh, that may need that. So herd immunity is important. The other thing to also consider is, um, and we don't have a, a ton of data, but it's uh, there's growing evidence that, um, you know, a, a question I get a lot is if I've already had COVID, why bother? Why do I need to get vaccinated, right? Because I have natural immunity. Well, the problem with that is one, we don't know how long natural immunity lasts. There are some studies that suggest that your natural immunity may not last uh, beyond three or four months. So the second uh, issue with that is that there are a lot of mutations or these variants that are starting to um, um, arise because a virus like any other virus, influenza, they change so that they can avoid detection. And so one of the concerns is that if you've had natural, if you had an infection last year naturally, 
you know, over the course of the year, when you meet one of these new mutations or viruses, is your body going to be able to fight that? Um, there's some interesting data from Brazil that shows that a large, in a city, a large proportion of the people were infected, but it looks like they may be getting reinfected again with these different variants. Um, the data from the vaccines uh, so far seems to show that it's very, still very effective against these variants, especially for uh, severe disease. So that's been uh, reassuring as well. So um, one of the things I do recommend is um, this virus is not going to go away magically all of a sudden in the summer. Uh, there's still going to be transmission. And so getting as many people vaccinated as possible will one, decrease the spread and two, uh, decrease the amount of mutations that this virus undergoes because it can't spread or replicate in people. So that's going to be really, really important. So even if you have had COVID in the past, we still recommend getting the vaccine. It's going to be important to make sure your immunity uh, is longer lasting and um, is protected against some of these newer mutations. And Dr. Andy, what about individuals with autoimmune uh, disorders? Um, very clearly the CDC says you, in general, you are more at risk from really bad things from COVID if you have these autoimmune diseases. So there are really no contraindications to or limitations just because you have an autoimmune disease. Um, uh, the, the COVID-19 virus really seems to uh, lay havoc to those with these underlying disorders. So vaccine definitely can help protect against that as well. So yes, I get that question a lot. I have you know an underlying autoimmune. We recommend that you get it because it will uh, provide a lot more protection than without. Thank you. Um, Michelle, um, can employers mandate that staff are vaccinated? A good question, Lynette. So at a state level, we certainly believe that the vaccine is our best hope fighting COVID-19. And we've been really proactive in our public health messaging from the governor to the Protect Michigan Commission and many, many others in encouraging Michiganders who are eligible for a vaccine um, to get their vaccine once they're eligible. Statewide, we have a goal of having 70% of our residents vaccinated as soon as possible and ensuring that in that vaccination, we're not seeing disparity between racial or ethnic groups. Neither Lara, so the department that oversees childcare licensing, nor Myosha, our occupational safety agency here at the state, is requiring employers to mandate the COVID-19 vaccine. If you are an employer and you are interested in mandating the vaccine for individual employers, our recommendation is that you consult guidance from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and from your own legal counsel about whether that is the right decision for your business at this time. Great, thank you. Um, and Oh, another question um, that I meant to ask uh, that did come in. Uh, how long do we anticipate the vaccine immunity will last? I know we're concerned that natural immunity from uh, contracting the virus doesn't last too terribly long, but we, how long do we anticipate the vaccine will give us immunity? That's a great question. So, you know, testing is still ongoing. Um, but it seems to be months, if not uh, at least a year. So we, the question I get asked, do you think we'll have boosters in the future? And, and in my opinion, I think we will because of different mutations and, and the way things work. I don't think this will be like a, a measles vaccine where you, where, you know, you receive it and you're done the rest of your life. I, I think this will be similar, if not, um, uh, to a yearly or maybe every few years, but I do think we will need boosters in the future, but definitely having the vaccine um, uh, gives you longer lasting immunity than just having natural immunity as well, so. Okay. Um, we have some questions that are coming into the chat uh, or Q&A uh, regarding cleaning. Um, so I, I wanna, catch a couple of those before 
uh, our time gets away from us here. Um, one of them, uh, Dr. Andy, goes back to your top 10 um, and was not quite about uh, cleaning, so I'm misleading us, uh, everyone, just a tad, but it was about the toothbrushing issue. So you are, were saying children should not be brushing their teeth currently in child care centers, correct? I think that was the initial recommendation on this. Sharon could uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It was just more about, you know, um, helping kids brush their teeth. Uh, but I may be mistaken. Maybe they, there's been a change recently, Sharon? You know, I don't know the answer to that, Andy. Um, I think when the recommendation was initially made, it, you know, had a lot to do with, number one, you have to have a mask off. You are in the mouth where a lot of transmission can occur. And again, it's that risk benefit um, decision. Is this something that's absolutely essential? We want healthy teeth for sure. And I'm hoping we'll get back to toothbrushing and all the other things soon. But I think, um, I think that is still a reasonable um, recommendation in terms of infection control. And, you know, we have to remember that there's not yet a va COVID vaccine for children. So the licensed vaccines, the youngest is 16. There are vaccine trials underway that we hope by the fall may um, make kids 12 and up eligible for the vaccine. But for the, these younger kids, it will be longer. So, and yes, the risk to children is much lower but it's not zero. Um, and so, you know, I think it's just important to remember we're also protecting kids who can take something home to a family. And so all the measures that we've been keeping in place, as desperate as we are to relax them, we're just not there yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, now as promised related to cleaning is, um, Dr. Andy, what about napping sheets and blankets? Do um, they still need to be sent home daily? Um, that's a great question. I think it's uh, up to the individual comfort level. Uh, I think uh, if you're using it on a daily basis and they're just using it to cover you know, their own kids and there are no symptoms. I think, I don't think it has to be done every day. That's quite a burden on, on families. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I do think that it's probably most important to follow some of the other recommendations we have in terms of, you know, hand washing, masking when appropriate, physically distancing when appropriate. Um, but whether, you know, washing the, the sheet every single day uh, makes a huge difference or not. Uh, I, I think that's much, much less clear. Um, so I would favor using some of the other strategies um, first uh, than focusing on kind of uh, sheet washing every single day, which, which is a lot for, for many parents, I think, so. Okay, and how about, um, can you be a little more specific? You had referenced um, uh, circulating toys. Uh, how many days or, would uh, toys need to be out of circulation before they can safely go back? And uh, do they need to be cleaned before they go back? If so, how? And what about books, which are you know a little bit uh, harder oftentimes uh, to ensure that every page has been cleaned properly? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So we're getting into the nitty gritty of what, what to do with a specific things. I think if you've got a very popular kid's book that you know, is being shared by multiple kids. I think you need to know about that and try to wipe it down as best you can, especially if it's a kind of a hardcover book. I do think that the virus is, again, relatively wimpy compared to like the norovirus, which causes bad vomiting, diarrhea. And that virus we know can live 24, 48 hours on a surface and still be quite viable. Uh, unlike COVID, I think initially with COVID, uh, people were, you know, as soon as they got home with groceries, they were either storing them away for 48 hours or wiping everything down. I think there's much of a less of an emphasis on that. Uh, I do think if the toy's been out of circulation uh, 48 hours or so, like, you know, um, I think that's fine. And I don't think we need to clean every single block. It's just not possible. So that's just a really practical way of, hey, how can I still include um, toys that, uh, you know, 
people can use safely without having to clean every single block. That, that's just impossible. And so trying to find practical ways we can do that. So in my opinion, I've been advising as long as it's, let's say it's Lincoln logs, that you keep it out of circulation for 48 hours and then kind of switch that with another toy for 48 hours. That's just a really practical way to make sure kids have fun, they're stimulated without taking away everything. Uh, I think there was questions about Play-Doh. Play-Doh, I, I think still can be individualized, right? In different containers, because they can tend to keep those and uh, mount those, but uh, some of the other toys, Legos can be swapped in and out. And I think that's a really practical way of uh, being able to continue to allow kids to play. And one last one, Dr. Andy, outdoor playground equipment or just outdoor toys, do they need to be cleaned? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think um, if you have, um, it's obviously, you know, you have, I've seen kids play on playground equipment and they're, you know, mouthing the handlebar or, you know, you know, I, I think if it's obviously dirty, I think cleaning is appropriate, but I don't think we're at a level where after a kid simply touches the swing or the slide, we have to go behind them and wipe everything down. I don't think that's necessary. Um, so I say, let them play at the end. If there's a break between different recesses or you know different classrooms, it might be reasonable, but to go around and chase kids as soon as they touch a piece of playground equipment to have to wipe that down immediately, that's way too far. I'm not worried about that. And so using common sense, again, targeted cleaning is the most important. And again, just being outside is a great thing. So that a lot of the, I think we have to remember a lot of transmission, the majority of transmission for COVID is through speaking through the air, right? And so that's why physical distancing outdoors are, are so effective, masks are so effective. So remembering that is, is going to be the really important as we move forward. So yeah, I was just I, I was just going to add exactly what Andy said, you know, it's the common sense, like the really high touch areas um, are the ones that could be wiped down periodically. But unlike the beginning of the pandemic, when you saw a lot of images on the television of foggers and spraying mm -hmm. and things like that, we're really not doing that and not recommending that. Um, uh, it, it, we wouldn't want children ingesting something like that, breathing it in. So wiping down, but not wiping down every little nook and cranny, really just the pull, the grab bars, the things that um, are, are touched by lots of kids throughout a day. Um, and Dr. Sharon, do you want to comment uh, on the need to continue having children and young children socially distance indoors and or outdoors? You know, again, we recognize child development and play. And so making things as natural as possible to keep children in smaller groups so physical barriers, rearranging furniture in certain ways, putting chairs at a certain distance at tables, things like that make the most sense. Um, physical distancing is important, but some of the rigid guidelines that really just aren't enforceable for young children um, uh, really don't have to be met. Um, you know, I think you use your common judgment it, it is that Swiss cheese effect where if you're doing all these things, if people are wearing masks, if it's a nice day like today and you can open windows to improve the ventilation, if you have more outdoor play, if you've rotated the toys, all these together make a safe environment. So you do the best you can with the tools you have, but we wanna let kids play. We wanna let them develop. Um, and we, we want to decrease people's anxiety. Um, uh, you know, you do the best you can. Thank you. Um, will quarantine rules change if all of the staff in a center are vaccinated and there is a positive case among one of the children? Go ahead, Sharon. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I can say that it will, ch we think it will change and, and Michelle may be able to address this at some point. We're, we're in this phase where now that we're getting a more vaccinated population and we're seeing from the CDC um, some newer guidelines around things like quarantining. So for example, a vaccinated person who's been exposed to someone with COVID, um, if they had their last dose of vaccine more than two weeks before, if they're not having any symptoms of illness, and if it's within three months of having gotten that vaccine, there may not need, be a need to quarantine for the CDC. I don't think the state policy has changed, but my guess is it would move in that direction. Um, for someone that hasn't had the vaccine, I think the quarantine rules will be the same as they are um, because they're still susceptible to getting the infection and transmitting the infection. And again, we have a whole population of children in the center who um, are not vaccinated. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Sharon. I, I think that's spot on. I, I know the CDC has pretty new guidelines around quarantine rules for vaccinated individuals. And the Department of Health and Human Services here in Michigan is taking a look at those guidelines and we're waiting for their green light to integrate them into our childcare operating procedures. So I'm certainly expecting updates to be coming your way um, in the next week or so. And if and when changes are made, we'll make sure to get those out to you um, through the licensing listserv. I know quarantine, changes to quarantine guidelines can have a real impact on staffing challenges that you're experiencing in, in centers and in your home. So we're anxious to get those updates to you as soon as we can. And um, question in the chat about testing, um, continuing to test children who are having COVID symptoms and uh, asking parents, um, continuing, I would uh, to ask parents to uh, remove them from childcare as quickly as possible. Should we be continuing with that? Yeah, I do. We're still at a, um, we're still at a critical stage where again, kids are not vaccinated yet to COVID. Um, kids can get infected and have very minimal symptoms as well. Um, not the severe ones sometimes as, as adults uh, commonly do. So if they have fever or, or cold symptoms and cough, um, uh, I, I still think um, it's very reasonable to continue to kind of either quarantine or test. Um, testing has become a little bit more widely available now. Um, so um, that's what I do recommend for many of my centers it, is to test. Um, to be honest with you, the, the PCR testing is much, much more reliable. Um, I know some places urgent cares have the antigen test, but that really hasn't been shown to be very reliable at all. So if you do test, I do recommend the, the PCR testing, which is much more accurate um, and will give you better data. Um, and I think for Michelle, a question about um, do parents have the right to know if their child care provider is uh, vaccinated? And if so, how would they get that information or where would they get that information? Uh, we're working on some tools at a state level so that centers and homes can volunteer that information to families. Um, through uh, systems like Great Start to Quality. And so we'll have more information for you coming on that, but we know that a lot of parents want to know and that there are centers and homes who are interested in promoting that information to families as a, an attribute, a safety attribute to help return, help families choose to return to childcare. So we're working on ways to help you volunteer that information for the families in your care. Great, thank you. And Lynette, well, I, I would definitely say that, you know, uh, my message to parents is that childcare is an incredibly safe place to send your kids. Um, um, I, again, I run a surveillance network of very many large centers in Washtenaw County and the rates for COVID has been, have been really low just because childcare providers, parents have all worked together uh, to kind of make sure that it is a safe place. So. Again, the, the rates are low. It's an incredibly safe place. It's an important place for kids to be at and develop and learn. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, 
uh, whatever we can do to make sure we um, have that safety in place is going to be important. So um, my messaging is not only to childcare providers, but parents I meet and talk to as well. Um, and our message that uh, it's an essential place. It's a much needed place for children to grow and develop. And, and I think it's very safe. If my kids are all older, but if they were younger, I would definitely be comfortable sending them to childcare. And it's because you guys do a, such a good job about putting in these strategies that are totally different from a couple of years ago, but you guys have been successful. And, and again, the data shows that it's a very, very safe place for kids to be. So I really appreciate all the hard work, the creativeness, just the communication with parents uh, that you've had to go through. And uh, it, it's been pretty amazing. So thank you. Yeah, and I'm excited. We're going to be sending a note out to you, um, all of the networks that connected you at this webinar um, in the next day or so, because we're going to get this crew back together in another week or so to talk to parents directly and give them some updates on what to expect from you as a child care provider. And so um, if you have parents that you're trying to lure back, um, that you can help promote that outreach, we will make sure that you get that in your inbox, like I said, in the next couple of days. Yeah, and Michelle, we did have questions, some really good questions um, that could probably be a webinar all of their own uh, about uh, sort of financial struggles uh, for child care centers. Um, are there uh, anything on the horizon policy help for yeah. those folks that you can address? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Lana. So we absolutely know that financials continue to be a challenge for child care providers. Your costs are up, your enrollment is down, and, and we stand next to you to try to mitigate that financial challenge. But we need a little bit of your help to get this money to you. So in February, Governor Whitmer proposed um, a $370 million investment in child care to help um, increase access to child care subsidy for families, to raise rates, to um, change how we pay subsidy on a temporary basis, to help you manage that disruptive enrollment, to get more grant dollars out to child care providers more broadly. That funding is stuck in the legislature right now. We can't spend any of those dollars without their authorization. So um, if you had a few minutes on your phone, on social media, to reach out to your lawmaker, you can ask Google who your state lawmaker is, your senator, your representative, and send them a note tell them that you're a child care provider in their community, that you are doing your best to serve kids and families, but that you need financial help. Um, we really need to create some noise for them. Um, so much of these dollars are federal resources that were passed by Congress in December. Um, and we're really anxious to get those dollars to you. So you're, add your voice. We're gonna be reaching out to you through organizations like Michigan AEYC, ECIC, Michigan's Children, many, many others to help elevate voices so that legislators can hear from you and we can get more grant dollars out to you so you can keep your doors open and focus on what you care most about, which is serving kids. Thank you. Um, I'm going to invite Emily Taylor, who is our mystery panelist uh, uh, and admin extraordinaire. I uh, forgot to note that at the beginning of the webinar to put up a slide uh, that has information if you don't already know uh, where to go or call uh, to get your vaccination, uh, please uh, get this information, particularly that uh, COVID-19 hotline phone number down. Um, and, it, and while you're looking at this, uh, reading through this and uh, getting the information uh, down. I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Andy and Dr. Sharon just to kind of wrap us up with uh, just a little summary of, of what they think are the key takeaway points for the strategies uh, uh, for returning to child care during the pandemic uh, and uh, to keep it all safe and fight COVID-19. Dr. Andy? Yeah, I would say, you know, it, it's, been, it's been a long year. Um, it's been a difficult uh, for um, families, for you, for child care providers, for the kids. And, but, you know, I do see light at the end of the tunnel. I, I think there have been a lot of positive things that I see. And so I would say, you know, continue to, let's continue to fight against COVID. We know what strategies work. We know that help is coming. And I think if we can continue to, you know, uh, not let our guard down and continue to use these strategies, we can continue to be successful. And uh, 
and turn things around. So I, I'm incredibly hopeful. Um, I'm hoping we can be as resilient as these young children have been who have kind of amazingly adapted to kind of the situation. And I'm uh, continuing to hope that childcare providers, pediatricians, uh, kind of stakeholders, uh, public health and at the legislative level, we can all work together to do what's you know best for children. And, and that's ultimately my goal. And so the things we talked about today are, are incredibly important and uh, and vaccines are, are, are part of that. You know, it's an individual decision, but again, it, it's it works and it's uh, definitely are gonna be our one of our most effective strategies to fight COVID. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And I know it's been in, uh, you're taking time from your evening, but uh, thank you for listening. And uh, you guys are uh, incredibly um, important to uh, those of us in the medical community. So thank you. Dr. Sharon. Yes, it's hard to really add to that, but just to say thank you as well for everything that you do for families and for children and everything you have been doing. Um, as Andy said, you know, rates within child care centers have been very low because of all the efforts that you've had in place. I really appreciate that people are willing to ask questions about the vaccine. I know there are a lot of questions out there. There's a lot of misinformation and, and there are good sources to get information um, to hopefully make you feel comfortable with your own decision. But from my standpoint, I do think um, the advent of the vaccine and its availability is going to be our way out of this uh, pandemic. And so I'm very hopeful. Um, I do see the light at the end of the tunnel. And um, I think we can all get through this together. Um, so thanks a lot for your attention and questions today. And Michelle had a message she was holding up a moment ago. Uh, uh, because I, it's, I'm just so grateful for all the people here. So I you know, pulled out my inner first grade teacher um, <laughs> and just cheering all of you on. And, and I just wanna emphasize that um, President Biden has called on many of our medical professionals to help prioritize educators, childcare professionals in the month of March. So many of our um, local health departments Many of our vaccination sites through pharmacy, Meyer, Rite Aid, many, many others have appointments that are available for you right now. Um, so that if you are interested, I know there are links here, michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. If you can't find a site, um, they, that site will help direct you to a place where you can get vaccinated. So that's us cheering you on and trying to um, stand next to you in, in this daily fight against the virus is prioritizing your vaccination and continuing to support you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Grateful for all the work you're doing. Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you all for the great work you're doing. Remember, in addition to getting your vaccine, take good care of yourself. Uh, lots of deep breaths, lots of walks while this weather is getting nicer, whatever it is that you do to take care of yourself, please do. Uh, thank you so much to Dr. Sharon, Dr. Andy and, and Michelle. Uh, have a great rest of your evening, and we will let you know as soon as this is available to put up on, on the uh, website at zerotothrive.org. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.